And the whole Federal Reserve System is unaccountable, is undemocratic, uh, is conducted uh, perniciously and incompetently, and has been against the best interests of this country almost since its creation. And the Fed is in total control of the economy. The government isn't, the president isn't, Congress isn't, the Federal Reserve is. The function of the Fed is to uh, uh, instigate depressions, to uh, reduce inflation, to uh, increase unemployment in order to keep wages down. And you can just go right down the list of every depression has been caused by the Federal Reserve since 1921. We lift the veil on the Federal Reserve, which along with the CIA, is our most secret organization and yet has enormous impact on all of us. We talk with an expert right now on alternative views. This is a program I've been wanting to do for a long time on Alternative Views. We're going to be talking about some books by William Grider, but we'll be emphasizing the Federal Reserve. A lot of people in the country wonder, what in the heck is the Federal Reserve? What does it do? And they think it's part of the government. Well, the Federal Reserve has an enormous influence and impact on all of us but we have no control. It's also very secretive, too. So hopefully, we'll, this is going to be a very illuminating program on alternative views. We have Jack Hopper with us, who's our economic consultant and who has uh, taught a class in this subject uh, previously. But before we hear from Jack Hopper and find out what the Federal Reserve is all about, let's have some news stories from the alternative press. Alexander Coburn recently wrote in The Nation that on July the 31st, Maxine Waters, who represents the South Central District of Los Angeles in Congress, uh, offered a bill calling for $10 billion in government loan guarantees for inner cities, such as Los Angeles, that have, of course, been destroyed in the events uh, there as part of the neighborhoods. In her letter to her congressional colleagues, Waters remarked, to date, we have done nothing to address the problem of our inner cities. On the floor of Congress, she said, we are on the brink of funding aid to Russia and a $10 billion loan guarantee for Israel. She says, said, I certainly understand the difficulties faced by Russia and Israel. However, don't our cities deserve preference? Waters, in fact, tried to attach her bill to legislation on act on aid to the former Soviet Union well, it was thwarted by a deal between the Democratic leadership and the White House, so her bill is currently languishing in the, House of the, in the hands of the House Banking Committee. In fact, no fewer than 240 House members signed a bill calling on Bush to submit for their approval a $10 billion loan guarantee for Israel, but when Waters went to try to get co-sponsors for her bill, to give aid to the cities of the United States. She could barely manage to get 36 co-sponsors, most of them members of the black uh, Congress. Israel, of course, is the highest recipient of foreign aid, of, of U.S. foreign aid of any country. And the Jerusalem Post wrote on September the 12th that six leading Israeli industrialists were asked how the $10 billion U.S. loan money should be used and they advised that it should go for the infrastructure. 
and for helping to finance the conversion of medium-sized Israeli companies into major multinationals. In other words, they want the U.S. loans to Israel to build up the Israeli infrastructure and corporations to make them more competitive on the world market at the very time that the U.S. infrastructure is deteriorating. Remember during the Vietnam War when the anti-war activists were claiming that the main thing that people were supporting if they went and fought for the United States in Vietnam is they were fighting for Exxon because uh, really there, there were a lot of oil deposits there, particularly offshore, and that's what the prime economic motive was for the war. And, of course, the U.S. government said, no, that's stupid. There's no such thing. There's no oil over there. And I always used to wonder about the Well, there's no oil over there. How come there's oil off the Chinese coast? Does it stop right there at that parallel that uh, when it becomes Vietnamese water? Well, I was looking at an old um, article here from the Spotlight in June of 1991 where they say that uh, an Australian ma uh, newspaper or magazine was saying that a senior Vietnamese government official had revealed that a delegation of U.S. oil men had secretly traveled to Vietnam in violation of Washington's uh, embargo against that country. The uh, uh, officials said that the delegation of the U.S. oil and gas industries, they met with leaders in Hanoi, uh, and of course, if you and I tried to do that, well, there'd be severe penalties against us. But several of the big oil companies interested in taking up offshore concessions were Chevron and Exxon. Supposedly, they held talks with Vietnam and uh, uh, in other third world countries over the past year. But so after all, those peaceniks were right. It looks like the war was about Exxon and oil production in Vietnam. They only had to fight a 15-year war, and Exxon looks like it's going to get what it wanted after all. They didn't need that war, did they? Well, oil is very, very, very big as a <laughs> motive for U.S. Uh, foreign policy. Well, we reported recently how the Republican right at a religious convention to try to get the moral majority going again and to support the Republican 1992 ticket indicated that claims that there was an environmental threat from ozone depletion was a plot by atheists. <laughs> well, at the end of September, a very uh, startling uh, report came out that indicated that the depletion of ozone over Antarctica is starting earlier and occurring faster than last year. Scientists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Boulder, Colorado, said that ozone layers readings over the South Pole last week were 15 percent lower than similar readings that were taken during a comparable week last year in 1991. They indicated that they got these ozone uh, layer, these ozone readings through high altitude balloons and claimed that this month's reading may be a result of both man-made chemicals and sulfur dioxides that were ejected into the atmosphere in 1991 combined with volcanic eruptions from Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines and Mount Hudson in um, Chile. It also is to be taken account of, they suggested, that it is mainly man-made chemicals, mainly uh, chloro, uh, fluorocarbons that are used in refrigerators air conditioners, and several industrial processes that are playing a major role in ozone depletion. So this de is a definite and a dangerous threat that's getting worse and that needs to have serious attention despite what the Republican right wing says. Well, we'll have to admit that the far right is right about one thing, which is fluoridation of drinking water. Uh, you may think that it's just loonies in the Ku Klux Klan and uh, Jack D. Ripper and Dr. Strangelove who said, have you ever seen a commie drink a cup of water? Who are criticizing fluoridation of water. After all, it's a good thing. It stops children from having cavities. Well, did you know, that Doug, that fluoride is actually a highly toxic industrial waste? <laughs> well, fluoride is actually one of the most toxic minerals that's beneath the Earth's crust. Um, it's a byproduct of just about any industrial process that involves mining. As early as the 19th century, this article in Covert Action uh, documents, fluoride was recognized as a major industrial problem. 
the byproducts from fluoride pol pollution destroy the, the bones and teeth of animals. They uh, destroy vegetation. And in places like Britain and Belgium, fluoride poisoning and the concomitant lawsuits resulting from it practically put a lot of industries out of business. Now, by the 1890s, they invented tall smokestacks to spread this fluoride way into the upper atmosphere. And that took care of the problem for a few decades. But by the 1930s, even with the tall smokestacks, there were just so many factories around that fluoride was once again poisoning fields. Crow cows would crawl on their bellies trying to graze because their bones just couldn't support them anymore. Uh, people were losing their teeth because fluoride settles in the teeth and the bones and makes them brittle and makes them crack, even though it may reduce cavities a little bit. So what happened? Uh, they decided that the best way to take care of the fluoride problem was not to clean up Industries Act, but to recycle it through our bodies. Uh, they called in a, the first spin doctor, Edward Bernays, uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, who wrote a book called Propaganda in 1926. Right. Well, in fact, the fluoride, uh, the whole fluoride issue is, is government propaganda. Um, the government wanted industry to expand. Of course, uh, they were gearing up for World War II and so they hired Bernays and Oscar Ewing, a big lawyer of theirs, and convinced people that fluoride was a good thing and that, in fact, we should put fluoride into the drinking water. Not only did this make people not afraid of fluoride poisoning, even though it's still going on, but it would take care of some of that recycle. Well, it would recycle the industrial waste in a good way. Uh, they had to clean it up some because you just can't have a farm around an industrial plant. So. They sell about 155,000 tons of this toxic waste to utilities every year, putting it into the drinking water. Now, how did they do this? Well, they hired a rogue scientist at the time <laughs> to go out to the west where there was a lot of fluoride in the drinking wells and conduct a study. He found out that even though the people had really discolored teeth and they were cracking very easily and breaking into little stumps, they, they didn't have cavities. <laughs> so it seemed like Maybe we could sell fluoride, maybe in low enough doses, it'd be good, it'd prevent cavities in children, and to heck with uh, testing it for cancer or other, other bad effects. So going on this one study, they began a, a massive campaign to sell the public on, the, uh, on the, the benefits of fluoridation of water. They immediately started fluoridating in the water supplies of cities without conducting any real scientific tests, and the next thing you know, Fluoride went from being one of the most dangerous and controversial industrial chemicals to being the friend of children and the, uh, the father of beautiful smiles. You know, do you see a parallel here with what is happening right now? There is uh, all of this uh, nuclear waste that we have, and so what's the solution? Well, they're going to irradiate food at the same type, <laughs> of, same type of thing, destroy the food value of the food, and also uh, some people have claimed that it causes, it can cause cancer. So the same thing is going on right now. We're going to go back to William Grider again. He wrote a book called The Secrets of the Temple, which is about the Federal Reserve. A book he wrote previous to that was about David Stockman. And most recently, Grider authored Who Will Tell the People, which is quite popular nowadays. Now, along with the Federal Reserve uh, section of the program, we're going to talk about the secrets of the Federal Reserve. This is a book by Eustace Mellon, Mullins. Uh, his book dovetails nicely with that of William Grider. Now, Grider used to be the managing uh, editor of the Washington Post, so he has some good establishment credentials, and also consequently he gets uh, reviewed by the, the establishment press. Jack, I guess maybe we should uh, talk briefly about the Stockman book and see how that glides into the Federal Reserve. Well, the Stockman book began as a, as a newspaper or a, a magazine article back in the early 80s as the uh, Reagan Revolution was taking over and, and which led, of course, to the horrendous deficits that we've got now. And uh, Grider interviewed Stockman at great length and got from, from Stockman the admission that they didn't know what the hell they were doing. 
<laughs> and they were just conning people. And uh, they were acting so confident, John Connolly confident style, <laughs> even though they didn't know what they were doing, that everybody thought they knew what they were doing. And they didn't. And um, Stockman was, was very quick to say that, that the budget was out of control, that their numbers didn't track, that they didn't know really uh, what, what everything was going to lead to. And what it did lead to, of course, was the frenzy of feeding in Congress when, when the Reagan administration proposed the tax cuts in which uh, uh, the congressmen, Democratic and Republican alike, uh, sold out to every special interest and, in effect, gave away all, all the tax requirements, and which led to this tremendous uh, process of, of deficit accumulation that we've got right now. Uh, well, this was, <clears throat> I guess perhaps what happens when a bunch of ideologues get in control like that and they're able to uh, try to put that into the real world. And it that, that's can... right. Ide ideologue means that these were religious nuts that thought that free market <clears throat> uh, activities and supply side theory uh, would solve all problems, regardless of whether it had ever been tried before, whether it made any sense before. Uh, it, it simply was in these people's best interest, one way or the other, to force it through. And it was a huge, horrible, expensive uh, experiment that was run and failed, and uh, and now we're having to face the prospect of what do we do about it. In that book, did they talk about them wanting to uh, do all this deregulation and uh, tax reform, et cetera, in order to soak up so much of the wealth and income from the middle class and lower class and take it back to the wealthy? Or was this just a consequence that they didn't foresee? Oh, no. The theory was, we, it was the trickle down or the trickle on theory <laughs> in which, uh, uh, hey, let's, let's give the rich more money. Uh, they will invest more and make jobs for the poor, undeserving people. That was the theory. And it was a straightforward arrangement. And uh, they began to shovel money out to the rich and the wealthy and the established in the corporation as fast as they could. And, and it was on the basis that that was the supply side theory. If you cut these people's taxes, they will create more than enough wealth and income to make up for the tax cut, which was nonsense. Everybody said it was nonsense. And nobody really believed it except the poor fools out there that were voting for Reagan. <laughs> Yeah, that is amazing how the very people who were getting screwed by Reagan and the system and Stockman or the boys are the ones who would be the first to wave the flag and vote Republican. Particularly labor people. There were a lot of labor people that voted for these crazy people and, and supported these crazy people and re-voted for them in 84. And yet they were, they were doing the country in. And uh, it's interesting then to move on beyond uh, the, the book The Education of, of uh, David Stockman in which Stockman admits that it's all smoke and, and mirrors, and it's all a, a, a game for uh, juveniles who were running a country at the time, and uh, who admits that they didn't know what they were doing, and it was a big riverboat gamble. That's what, what some people call it. Um, they moved from there, of course, into the, into the prospect beyond 81 and 82 of running the country. In The Secrets of the Temple, which we're going to talk about a little later, uh, the Fed was horrified. The members of the Federal Reserve who saw this take place and who were responsible for the monetary side of the equation, uh, they, were, they knew that none of this was going to work. They knew none of this could, could uh, do anything other than cause the problems that they did. They didn't say anything about it because it wasn't their thing. Uh, you got, got to understand that there are two kinds of, of economic policies in this country. One is, is fiscal policy which is run by the federal government itself out of the Treasury Department. And that is the, the, government's, the, the federal government's budget of spending and, and taxing. That's fiscal policy. The other policy, which is far more important, is, is conducted by and is a responsibility of the Federal Reserve System. And of course, if those two policies conflict, we'll have horrible circumstances. And that's exactly what happened in the early days of the, of the Reagan administration. Uh, fiscal policy was out of control, and, and uh, the Fed thought it was its responsibility to not only halt inflation in its tracks, but also to make up the bad effects of bad fiscal policy. But there is no coordination of the two. The Fed supposedly is independent and supposedly 
monetary policy is, is to be conducted totally independently of the government and of the Treasury Department. And generally, that's what happens. Well, now, didn't, uh, weren't the Reaganites in a position to put some of their people in control of the Fed? Wasn't Volcker, wasn't he one of these? Didn't he go right along with uh, this type of policy? Even no. Though, even though he came in under Carter, wasn't no. he? No. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, Volcker was horrified at all this. This What he thought was irresponsible fiscal uh, action would lead to mother, more inflation. I mean, his life's goal was to halt inflation. And deficits helped create more inflation. And so he, he felt his responsibility was to be even tougher and be even more, more stringent in terms of monetary control to try to offset the bad effects of that fiscal policy. And, and of course, there came a time and, and those times varied, uh, when the Reaganites didn't like Volcker. And as a matter of fact, uh, it, things got bad enough so that they refused to reappoint him, hmm. and they didn't like him. Meanwhile, yes, as the people went off of the Federal Reserve System, Board of Directors, Board of, board of Governors, uh, the Reaganites replaced them. But they didn't necessarily replace them with people that were a whole lot different. Well, let's take a look at the Federal Reserve, because there was so much ignorance about it, uh, so much secrecy involved in it, uh, and yet people want to know what it is, how it works, and who runs it. Well, let, let's start off by looking at this book and this title, All right. Secrets of the Temple. And so what Grider proposes to do is expose the secrets of the way the Fed is run, who runs it, and why, and what the bad effects are, and the temple, run out of the temple. The temple is thought of as the Federal Reserve System mausoleum on Constitution Avenue in Washington. It, if you've ever been in that building, you will be impressed. It's all marble. And of course, it was built because the Federal Reserve has a bottomless uh, 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 pocketbook. The Federal Reserve has all the money it knows how to spend, is not responsible for anybody to tell how that money is spent, and can blow that money any way they want to, and they do. Well, it can create money. Well, it creates the money, but the money it spends mm -hmm. is tax money. It's tax money. It's not created money. Those are, those are separate. The Federal Reserve can't just print money and spend it. It doesn't do that. What it does is expand the money supply, let the banks print the money, and then it, by the process of creating the money supply, it, it, it gets government bonds, which it gets the interest on, and that's what it spends for its own expenses. Well, that's its own expenses, but it can interject uh, more uh, money into the system. Yes, correct? well, I was speaking of the, of the great marble mausoleum that oh. was spent by its own internal money. But once again, that's the temple. And the whole Federal Reserve System is unaccountable, is undemocratic, uh, is conducted uh, perniciously and incompetently, and has been against the best interests of this country almost since its creation and yet it is never called to account for its bad practices and policies. Well, let's talk about its creation. <clears throat> in the, particularly in the book, the Secrets of the Federal Reserve, it talks about how the, uh, how the uh, Fed came about, but from a rather circuitous way. <laughs> well, that's true. The whole notion of the, <clears throat> the word Federal Reserve System, every other country in the world has a central bank. And the purpose of a central bank is to conduct uh, monetary policy, and that's what the Federal Reserve does. But in 1914, the bankers would not let the public have any say and do not let the public have any say in, in the monetary policy of the country. And therefore, they created this weird monster called the Federal Reserve System made up of 12 uh, regional banks each of which set its own policy, and that, that was kind of the way they did it in the early days. Later, the policy accreted uh, partially to Washington, so that it was shared by Washington and by these 12 central banks, these 12 regional banks. Now, in the, is, in the history of it, according to Mullins, the, there was a National Monetary Commission set up to try to come up with some new type of, of central banking system or some system that would take the ability of the big banks, particularly J.P. Morgan and all, to play their games and cause uh, uh, panics and deflations and uh, which were hurting the, the, the general populace. And 
the commission didn't do anything until after there was a secret meeting of the nation's uh, largest bankers plus uh, Senator uh, Aldridge, who was connected with the Rockefeller family. And, and who was on, uh, very, very influential mm -hmm. in that, that, com that National Monetary Commission. Mm -hmm. And they got together in tremendous secretly, uh, secrecy off Jekyll Island in uh, Georgia and came up with a system of uh, which evolved into the Federal Reserve. Now there were some, uh, um, they didn't get this passed the way they wanted to. The, the Aldrich bill put this, uh, tried to get this passed. Uh, it was not passed, but then later after Woodrow Wilson came in, they came up with another bill which was quite a bit like it. And uh, much to the, uh, although the, well, the banks and uh, in other parts of the country, in the South and West, were against it because they didn't want control from Wall Street. But it was the same group, basically, it was on Jekyll Island, who behind the scenes helped to develop the Fed as it became. And as Paul Warburg, who was the uh, principal person in on the Jekyll Island uh, scheme, uh, he helped to put this together and said, well, it isn't all that we wanted, but we'll be able to, t to take care of these with administrative uh, actions. And it was then the bankers who, uh, in fact, took over the Fed and who uh, took over as the main stockholders in the Fed. So they really got what they wanted, and they've had it that way ever since. Well, in 1904, there was a, there was a panic <clears throat> and somewhere around 1904, 1905, and Theodore Roosevelt went to J.P. Morgan and said, uh, can you bail the country out? Yeah. Uh, well, J.P. Morgan had always done it before. The Wall Street correspondent banks had always done it before, but this year they had a hard time doing it. And so it became obvious that, that the country was too big for these correspondent banks to do that. And so that's why that, that commission was formed up. But the Republicans were still in control and refused to, to make any real changes until uh, Wilson was elected, the Democrats were elected, and then, of course, they perverted the original intent of having a central bank into the abortion that we see now, which is the Federal Reserve System. But as like in, uh, in D.C., all the congressmen say the banks never lose. The banks were able to get in and get control and run it for their benefit ever since. That, that's right, and what that does is point up the temple aspect of this thing, that the Federal Reserve is treated like, even by the press and by the public, as some kind of a magic arrangement and a religious arrangement, and maybe like the Catholic Church. The <laughs> chairman is the, is the pope, and the, uh, the various members of the Open Market Committee are the bishops and the cardinals, and uh, they go around uh, speaking this uh, Latin language and doing these strange things, all of which is supposed to be good for us and preordained, and so we shouldn't question it or pay much attention to it. And that's the way it works. 33% of the people in a, in a recent poll appear to understand that the Federal Reserve is the one that controls the money supply, meaning they're the ones that control the economy. The other 66%, I don't know who, who they think does it, but they don't know that the Fed does that. And the Fed is in total control of the economy. The government isn't, the president isn't, Congress isn't, the Federal Reserve is. Mm -hmm. and, and they do it in a secretive way, in an undemocratic way, uh, in a way that, that suits their own purpose and their own very narrow clientele, which are the rich people and the bankers and the Wall Street people. Yeah. It's uh, significant for people to realize that the Federal Reserve is actually a uh, a corporation. It is owned, their stock ownership. As a matter of fact, uh, you said 66% about the people. It's, it's, it's uh, interesting that 66% of the stock is owned, uh, according to Eustace Mullins in, uh, in the mid-80s, by uh, 10 banks. And so if they're like usual corporations, you can control a corporation real easy by owning that much. Some of these banks are also European banks. But these Banks which own that much of the stock, of, well, I'm talking about the New York uh, Fed, which is the main one, they are also interlocked through interlocking directorates and through family alliances. So it's, uh, it's a fairly cohesive group of, uh, of financial organizations that we're talking about there. Yes, and it's, it's uh, Grider argues that, it's, that the, the function of the Fed is to uh, uh, instigate depressions, to uh, reduce inflation, 
to uh, increase unemployment in order to keep wages down. Uh, his position is that, that there is no interest at the Fed never, ever in, in economic growth or expansion. It's always in terms of is inflation picking up and do we need to tighten the money supply? And the reason is, of course, that the bondholders who stand to lose by inflation are in control of the system and the Wall Street people that, that deal with the bonds. That's Grider's argument, and, and I, it's, it's a pretty persuasive argument that, that those are the people that are running the economy of the country to the expense of the rest of us. Now, before 1914, we didn't have a central bank. We had a central bank kind of before Andrew Jackson, well, called the Bank of the yeah. U.S. Now, Jackson did away with it, and there was this wonderful quote where he said that uh, if the people only understood the rank injustice of our money and banking system, there would be a revolution before morning. And that was, that's true of today. If, if, if the people out there who were thrown out of work and, and are forced into bankruptcy, particularly in 1981, when Volcker raised interest rates up to 20%, if those people really knew how it was done, who did it, and why it was done, and, and the overall result, they would prof probably have assassinated the uh, Federal Reserve Board of, Board of Governors. <laughs> uh, speaking of Volcker, there was another quote, a, a, either an economist or a congressman said, putting Volcker, who was a Rockefeller man brought up uh, all through all these Rockefeller organizations, economic organizations, he's the economic Kissinger, the counter, economic counterpart of Kissinger. Anyway, they said putting Volcker in charge of the Fed is like putting Dracula in charge of the blood bank. Let's take a look at the Fed and how it works. It, uh, some people say it's very simple. All the Fed does is determine the amount of money and the interest rate. But when you get down to it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. What are well, the functions of, course, of the Fed? Of course, it's, it's really complicated in, in controlling how much expansion and controlling how much deflation you have. And, and as a matter of fact, the disaster of the 81 period was a direct result of Volcker either, uh, either through his own interest picking up Milton Friedman's argument that the, that the Fed ought to control the money supply by, by that process. Uh, that, that, that's the way it was, it was done. And of course, uh, uh, it, it isn't that simple. It turned out to be very complicated and, and a changing target. But the Fed has a lot of, lot of functions. It has more than one function. At first, it, it's supposed to control the money supply. And second, uh, it's supposed to uh, be a lender of last resort to its banking members. Now, all, not all banks are members of the Fed. Uh, a lot of banks are not Federal Reserve members. Most banks are not Federal Reserve system members. They're either state banks or they're national banks who aren't Federal Reserve. They're, they're some, something other than that. So the Fed lends money to banks who can't get money any other place, and so that's another function of it. That was the original function. That was the original intention of how, how to change the money supply. And then finally, it's a regulator of its own banks and of bank mergers and of, of the banking system. So it's, it's kind of the, the federal regulator of the banking system, although it shares it with the control of the currency and with, with other, other institutions too. Okay, now you said it regulates the money supply. Uh, first of all, how does it do this? Well, it buys, its primary method is to buy and sell securities, federal securities in the open market, and by taking, taking the securities uh, off the market and replacing them with its own credit, and that credit can be used to expand credit, uh, bank credit, it expands the money supply by enlarging loans. And by extinguishing, by, by uh, 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 issuing these bonds, or selling these bonds, it takes cash money or credit, bank credit money away from the banks and puts it inside the Fed where there can be no credit made on that. And so the banks can't expand as much, make as much lending expansion when they are holding bonds as they can when they're holding Federal Reserve credit. So when they sell, these are U.S. government bonds yes. or they can be any type of bonds? No, they're, they're, they're government bonds. So when they sell bonds, they're... Re when the bonds are sold, the, the banks or whoever buys the bonds pays in, in, in bank cash, and the bank cash is taken out of circulation. So that reduces the money supply. Okay. And when the opposite takes place, when, when the bonds are bought, the Fed replaces the bonds 
and replaces those bonds in the, in the public's hands with money that can be used to expand credit. So then what happens to that, uh, that credit or money? The banks, uh, how do the banks... The banks, the banks then create money through the banking process by making loans. Mm -hmm. Because... But they make bank money, and bank money is deposits. Mm -hmm. and, and so they expand their deposits by making these loans. When you make a loan, what you do is tell, tell whoever you make the loan, okay, guys, we have just created a credit in your name in our, in our uh, deposit account. So what they do is just open up a new deposit in that bank, which acts like money, and you can check on it. So they're really creating money. They're creating money, and that's, that's the magic here. The whole notion of creating money, particularly paper money, has a magical air about it. It's one thing to understand that gold or silver can be money. Once you mine it, it's worth something, it's money. But to create money, paper money, out of thin air, and buy things and do things with, with that is magical. It has a religious connotation. And that's what Grider argues. And that's why it's called the temple, because the, the institution that creates the money uh, in this magical way has got to have something religious about it. Well, I'll, there's more than that, though, of course. It goes on to the fact that if you create too much money, if you spend too much money, it's sinful. You, 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 are, you are a sinful person, or you are a sinful country. You have overspent your your ability, and you must suffer. Uh, the result is that, that you must uh, pay the price, and the Fed makes you pay the price. And therefore, we've got all these, these Calvinistic attitudes about money and overspending and underspending, and that's why it's called the temple. And that's why the politicians, I guess, don't want to be responsible for it, and they are not. Only these Fed people are responsible for this, and they are answerable to nobody. Now, why would they want to increase the money supply? Well, uh, if, if the country is, is, uh, needs to expand, and uh, to the extent that, that there's no inflation, then that's always the overriding concern. Is there inflation? Is there danger of inflation? Then, of course, as the, as the country creates wealth through manufacturing and through production, there's got to be an additional amount of money to cover that. Otherwise, there's not enough money to cover the new additional uh, wealth and you will have depression and deflation, which is what we had all during the, uh, the last century. We had deflation all during that time because there was no Fed to create money. There was no increase in the gold supply, and that's the way the gold was based in those days. And yet we had this tremendous increase in production. And there was no money to cover the increased production, so there was deflation because there was <coughs> the, the, the product was, was worth more in monetary terms then. <clears throat> is that, isn't that the problem uh, that uh, people have with people saying that we should go back on the gold standard, a strict gold standard, because the gold, uh, the money supply cannot increase when you need it, only if you get more gold or there's more gold well, that, that, mined? That's true. What you do is uh, uh, mortgage your ability to grow and to expand to the South African gold mines because that's the only place gold comes from, is the South African gold mines. And if they decide to, to shut the gold mines down, then you can no longer expand your money supply if you're dependent on gold. So they have to have a flexible system where they can print more money whenever they need to. Well, they, mean, they, that's right. What we need... Or provide more credit. We know, we know how this system works. We shouldn't be dependent on some crazy international commodity, which is gold and silver, to allow us to do what we want to do with our economic system. We can handle that in a different way, and we don't have to depend on uh, miners or, or opening up new mines or, or whatever to do that. Now, if the Fed increases the money supply, that only goes to the banks that are part of the uh, Federal Reserve System. No, it, it, gets, it gets to all of them. I mean, just through circulation? Yeah, because uh, let, let's assume First, that, that only Federal Reserve members buy uh, or get the, get the bank credit, which isn't true. Anybody with bonds can sell those bonds to the Fed and get bank credit. Treasury bonds, you mean? Treasury bonds, right. And so if the Fed is in the open market to sell bonds, anybody can do that. Okay. And, and that includes insurance companies, individuals, uh, anybody. But only the commercial banks have the ability to expand the money by making bank money. So that's where the expansion takes place. So any bank that gets bank credit 
can expand the money supply, whether it's a Fed member or not. Now, can the Fed help to, in, uh, to create prosperity by creating more money, thereby stimulating the economy, or does it only follow when the production goes up, like you say? Uh, theoretically, the, the Fed is supposed to follow production and expand the money supply to accommodate it, but it doesn't always do that. And that's been the problem. In fact, it's, it's been just the opposite in cases. And it, 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 has, it has been a failure in a lot of cases to do what it should have obviously done, which is accommodate production. It's been, it is overly concerned with inflation. It's overly concerned with wages being higher than somebody thinks they ought to be. And so its interest is not to accommodate production, but to cut off wage increases and, and to increase unemployment in such a way that inflation can be kept to a minimum. And that's its goal. Now, that's not supposed to be its goal. But the people that run this Fed and the banking system that's in control of it choose to do that. Now, we've had the full employment bills that have been passed. They've never uh, been applied to the Fed. And yet the government is in, is in favor of full employment. But we never have it. We'll never have it as long as the Fed is independent of politics. Okay, let's go the opposite. What happens when the Fed decreases the money supply? Well, you decrease the money supply, you cut off credit, uh, you cut off people's ability to borrow, and people's ability to pay, and people's ability to expand, so you have a depression. And that's what we had in 81, because that's what they did. They cut off the money supply in 81, and we had a depression. Uh, Mullins talks about the uh, depression of the 20s, the early 20s. They were saying there was prosperity, particularly economic prosperity, and there was small businesses and all. But the Fed suddenly retracted uh, all uh, so much money in credit uh, that the small business and the farmers could no longer get credit. We had a depression. The farmers were driven off the land. A lot of people were driven out of business. In the meanwhile, the big guys who had the money were able to come and uh, buy up a lot of land and a lot of uh, uh, smaller companies at bargain basement prices. And his point is that he sees that the, uh, this happening on a periodic basis where they can go in and do that. But this one, he uses it as a prototypical example of how the Fed can, act, can cause a, a depression, and particularly then, selectively, particularly hurting certain segments of society and the economy. Well, he, I think he points to the, the depression of 21 because yeah. that was the first time the Fed had a chance to do the right thing, and it did the wrong thing. And it's done the wrong thing almost every time since then. I mean, this Federal Reserve is not in our best interest. This Federal Reserve never works in most of the public's best interest. And Grider makes the argument that they're really there only to protect the bondholders and to, and to minimize in, inflation, minimize wages. Whether that's true or not, the truth is these people have blown it too many times. And you can just go right down the list of every depression has been caused by the Federal Reserve since 1921. Since we've had the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Absolutely. They have caused it. And they've caused it as an attempt to try to restrain inflation, restrain growth. Sometimes that might have been useful. And of course, in, in 1979, everybody wanted that to happen. But these people overdid it. And they overdid it because they didn't think, first, they are unaccountable. And they could, they could bankrupt as many people as they wanted to and laugh in everybody's face. And that's what they did. Uh, so they've got no, no uh, harm comes to them to overstate their case. And so they've got no incentive to not over, overstate everything they do. And that's what they always do. Okay, we talked about expanding and contracting of the currency. What about the uh, interest rates? Well, interest rates flow from, from the supply of money. Supply and demand for money uh, is, is the factor that causes interest rates to fluctuate because interest rate is the price of money. And if you expand the money supply, then you expand the amount of money and then you drive down the price of money, which is interest. But the Fed can uh, crank it up or, or take it down at will as, as, as it wants to, depending on what it wants to accomplish, right? Well, that's right. The, the, the discount rate, right? Generally, well, the discount rate is seldom used. The, the expanding of open market activities is the way they control it. And traditionally, the Fed has controlled the money supply through interest rates by watching what happened to interest rates as they expanded the money. And if the Fed thinks interest rates ought to be lower, 
then they will not only ex expand the money supply, but they will also lower the discount rate because uh, the, the open market activity in which they're buying and selling uh, securities is so secretive and so delayed that they have to have another signal in order to tell people what they really mean because nobody knows what they mean because of the secrecy. So the discount window, which originally began is, a, is the traditional way that you expand the money supply, and the Bank of England still uses that. That's still their method. Uh, that's no longer used to expand the money supply and to control interest rates anymore. The open market activities is, is the way our Fed does that. Okay, can you uh, explain that a little bit further, the difference of the, the, open, the open market uh, activity and the, uh, the, the, dis the, what, the discount, discount window? Discount yeah. window. Yeah. Yeah. The discount yeah. window is never used. The discount window is a place that a bank can come that, that uh, is, is in need of money. In other words, it's being drawn, it's, it's, it's got problems out there and it needs to draw some money from somewhere. And, and it, originally the Fed was, was the lender of last resort to the banks. And the discount window was a place they came. And if you raise the interest rate, you discourage the bank from borrowing money, therefore you didn't expand the money. But that, that didn't work anymore because the other, other things intervened and the Fed began to use open market activities, buying and selling securities on the open market, as a way to, to expand and contract money, the money supply. But as I understand it, the discount window is used daily by big banks just to take care of balance of imbalances you know, the federal here funds, and there. The federal funds market is okay. used. Uh, the discount window is seldom ever used. The federal funds okay. market is used on a day is on, used on a daily basis by every bank to sell and buy its surplus and its, and its shortage daily. And it's, it's done by wire, and, and the federal funds rate itself is the one that really counts, but that's not set by the Fed. Oh, it's not set by no, the, the Fed. The Fed doesn't set that. The market sets that. But all of it kind of flows from the Fed's open market activity and the discount window. Does the Fed determine the reserve requirements of the big banks? Well, they, they do of their members. Now, some of the big banks aren't Federal Reserve members. And therefore, the state will set that reserve requirement. The control of the currency will set that, that re reserve requirement. But if, if they are national banks as members of the Federal Reserve System, then the Fed will control them. No. Uh, there's, a, there's a split between national banks uh, and Fed members who are controlled by the, the Office of the Currency. The, off, the, the control of the currency oversees those people. Federal Reserve members who are not national bank members. Uh, I, I don't know what the current, I forget what the current arrangement is, but uh, state banks not in the Fed membership are controlled by the state, and then you have the two federal agencies that overlap control of the, of the national and the Federal Reserve member banks. But only Federal Reserve members can borrow from the Federal Reserve discount window if it wants to, if they want to. Mullins talks about how the Fed has even gone far, so far as to make loans independently of the U.S. government, loans to foreign banks or foreign governments. Uh, does Greider talk about uh, that at all? Well, the New York Fed controls or, or is the operative for our international monetary balancing process. And generally that's done in cooperation with the, with the Department of the Treasury because the Treasury has a very, very strong interest in, in external uh, monetary affairs and that's something really that, that is kind of shared, I think. Is, uh, I don't know what Mullen was talking about when he said, w was he saying that Fed made loans? Right. And well, independently of the U.S. government, in the past it has done that when it uh, considered that it was wise to help out either a central bank in Europe or, or some uh, organization like that. Ryder doesn't deal with that. Uh, and generally that's not done anymore independent mm -hmm. of the Treasury. The Treasury, the... Uh, the State Department is very much involved with that kind of circumstance, and there's a lot of cooperation between the State Department and the Fed on that score. One of the things that people criticize the Fed for is uh, that it can make or break a president. Now, is this true? The Fed says no, but is this true, and has it well, done it? Arthur Burns helped make Nixon, and, uh, and the Federal Reserve has never lived down the shame of him pandering to Nixon. How did he do that? Well, he, he expanded the money supply during the election. And uh, that created and, prosperity. And that had, right. And we didn't have the kind of situation that Bush faced by having a depression in the, in the middle of his campaign. 
And uh, the most graphic example is, is that poor foolish Carter appointing Volcker, who immediately uh, contracted the money supply in the middle of that election, and that's what beat Carter. And Bert Lance told him that if he elected, if he appointed Volcker, that Volcker would do that and that Carter would lose that election, and he did. <laughs> Bert Lance was a banker that knew, knew what was going on, but I'm afraid those other uh, simple people from Georgia around Carter didn't understand all that. It's, I think it's very revealing that uh, looking at the history of the Federal Reserve since we've had it, that the chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, with a couple of exceptions, have been very opposed to the Fed, very critical of it, and would like to see it abolished. I don't think abolish is the word, Frank. I think, I think uh, brought under political control and brought in as part of the government. Okay. Uh, the advocacy is for the Federal Reserve to become a, a branch of the Treasury, and that's where it ought to be, and that's what ought to happen. But it's probably never going to happen because we're already losing. Us citizens have already lost control of the government. Is there any reason to think that we're going to gain control of, of something like this? Uh, it's not going to happen unless we do something else. How much effect and control over the economy and our prosperity does the Fed have? Oh, about 90 percent. That much? The control of the money supply. Milton Friedman has claimed all along it's 100 percent. Well, I don't think it's quite that much. Monetarist, the monetarist school, which controls the Fed now, uh, would have you think that nothing matters but, but the control of money. Uh, the Keynesian, of course, thought that, that the main thing that, that was important was fiscal policy. And, of course, the truth is somewhere in between those. But monetary, I said 90 percent, that may be a little high. But monetary policy is really important, particularly in the, in the long run. This dovetails with a quote by Baron Nathan Meyer de Rothschild, the, uh, of the Rothschild banking family that has branches all over the world through family ties as well as uh, uh, commercial and financial ties. But he said decades and decades ago that the man that controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the British money supply. Well, at least uh, <laughs> to some extent, I think he was under some some control of the British government at the time, because the Central Bank of, of England has always been uh, subservient to to whatever administration was in, and and is is today. But that's in contrast to our Fed, which is which claims to be and acts and and uh, effectively uh, doesn't let any any of the of the popular democratically elected people have anything to do with it. Now, there are banks and there are banks. Um, the commercial banks can do things which, say, credit unions or savings and loans, when we add savings and loans, or other types of uh, uh, banks. Uh, they cannot do it. I understand the commercial the banks can uh, create money, but the others have to, they can't create credit uh, except what they have in their vault, so to speak. Well, not only that, but they also have to be working with a bank, a commercial bank, because what they do, of course, is, is uh, lend the money that goes through the commercial bank. And, and the commercial bank has, it's, it's another matter of fractional banking, in which the bank only has to keep about $8 out of every 100 they lend. And then the other, other $92 is, the credit they create is money. Uh, the other institutions besides commercial banks can't create the money that way because they've got to work through the commercial banking system to do it. Here's a quote from Grider in this regard. He said, the Federal Reserve was not born in isolation. It was the keystone of a profound alteration that occurred in the American culture of self-government. Devaluing the potential representative democracy and imposing limitations on it. Is the new perspective held that the popular will, which was so turbulent in the 19th century, must be restrained in this new age of multiplying complexity and scale? I guess that's just a rather complex way of saying uh, the, the big guys wanted to control it because they were afraid of the, uh, of the will of the people that was in all this ferment down below. 
Well, I think that's that's a little bit overstated, Ryder. <laughs> I, I I don't think I'd want to agree that there was a change when this took place. I agree. The with banking that. system always controlled itself. Uh, there was a time there when Andrew Jackson put them in a little bit of disarray, but but it wasn't long. They recovered fast. The national banking system was created in 19, 1863 to finance the Civil War, and it did it. And banks were allowed then to print money, bank money, which was became a full scale currency. And the banks cr uh, control the system from 1863 to the time the Fed was created. And then they got control of the Fed immediately. They wrote the Fed Act to, to, to allow them to keep control of it. There hadn't been any change. <laughs> I think Grider overstates that. Well, does this fall under the category of class warfare that we've seen uh, in operation so blatantly in the Reagan administration that you referred to in the uh, Stockman book? Well, well Grider points out two things that I, I would certainly like to bring out. One is that Volcker and the Fed in, eight, in, in, in 1980 created the circumstances that led to the SNL debacle. I mean, they did it. The Federal Reserve screwed the system up to the point where the SNLs disintegrated and then from all of that problem of high interest rates flowed the SNL debacle and the $500 billion and they never got any of the blame part. Those turkeys never got any of that blame. The other thing was uh, these guys consistently, and Volcker says, I want to break the unions. Volcker said, I am in the business of breaking the unions to restrict in, uh, uh, wages, to keep wages down, to make sure that inflation stays low. And that's been the unstated policy of the Fed all along, too, to break unions to keep people in the lowest wage levels they can and to keep unemployment levels as high as they can get away with. And they are at historic levels right now for, for the circumstance. Hmm. What can the people do about it? Given the fact that our democratic system itself is out of control and given that Ross Perot was so popular because he was beaten up on the democratic system that was working so poorly, uh, we got to take control of our democratic system before we can take control of this monetary system because we can't go at this monetary system. It's, it's too insulated, it's too powerful, uh, it's too secret, and uh, it, it's just not something we come to grips with directly without getting our hands on the democratic system then to shake this damn uh, Federal Reserve system up. And that's the end of this Alternative Views frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on alternative views and also a reading list for US power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network P.O. Box 7279 Austin, Texas 78713 you must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to thank our crew for this program, Brian Lynch, Kimma Cargill, Rodney Goodwin, and Dinah Craven. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Want to write to us? Please do. Bye.